Hello and welcome back to another free webinar by mdct.com.au. My name is Shabel Sadi. And this is part three of a four part series in emergency radiology imaging. In this lecture, we will look at the anatomy of the pleural space, the physiology and radiographic appearance. Also, we'll look at chest imaging in emergency, such as a pneumothorax. A small amount of lubricating fluid lies within the cavity of the pleural space. The lung fissures extend between the lobes of each lung and are lined by two layers of the visceral pleura. So anatomically, the pleural sac, which actually shows the visceral and the parietal pleural membranes, the visceral pleura extends into the lines both sides of the horizontal fissure. The inferior extent of the posterior pleural space which is well known on the lateral projection or the costophrenic angles, this posterior depth is considerable and not obvious from a PA or frontal chest radiograph. So more importantly, when imaging chest x-rays, full inspiration is vital. And more importantly, the ability to suppress the diaphragm which sits above, uh, above the liver to push it down to flatten it out as much as possible. The horizontal fissure, as well as the lung fissures, it is formed by two layers of the visceral pleura. So we know that the parietal pleura is the outside aspect of the pleural space, whereas the visceral pleura is the internal lining or the medial aspect of the pleural space. And this is the potential space between these two opposed layers. So in humans, the parietal and visceral pleura merge at the hilum of the lungs, which separate the thorax into two non-contiguous spaces. The pleura is composed of a dynamic membrane of mesothelial cells and a deeper layer of connective tissue containing vessels, nerves and lymphatics. This membrane responds to actively to adjacent inflammation and accumulations of fluid, such as when someone has left-sided heart failure within its space. So let's take a closer look at the pleural space. As we know, on the external aspect or closest to the chest wall, we have the parietal pleura. And on the medial aspect, which is adjacent to the lung parenchyma, is the visceral pleura. And from the pleural space, you have the mesothelial layer, then you have the submesothelial connective tissue layer, the superficial elastic tissue layer, then you'll have your loose subpleural connective tissue layer, and then the closest to the lung parenchyma is the fibroelastic layer. If we go further into these five layers of the visceral pleura, from the pleural surface, these layers are the following. First, you have a single layer of mesothelial cells. And then the second is the thin submesothelial connective tissue, which includes the basal lamina. Third, a thin superficial elastic layer. Fourth, you have a loose connective tissue layer, which contains capillaries, fat cells, valves, nerves, and lymphatic valves. Then on the fifth level, or layer, you have your deep fibroelastic layer, and then you will have your alveoli. So what's really important to understand here is the reason why we have accumulations within the pleural space is because you have a capillary network, which is the loose connective tissue. You also have pleuritic chest pain, which comes from the nervous system. So let's look at the physiology of how it actually works now. What happens with the fluid as it passes in and out? As you can see in this diagram, you have hydrostatic pressures which are higher on the parietal pleura than on the visceral pleura. And the oncotic pressures are equivalent. Therefore, pleural fluid is primarily pro pro produced from the parietal pleura.
The lymphatic vessels on the parietal pleura are responsible for the majority of pleural fluid reabsorption. So let's just take a closer look. If we look at the parietal space versus the visceral space, you have your hydrostatic pressure, which is at 30 centimeters of water. And then you have your hydrostatic pressure on the, on the visceral side, which is 29. So there is a difference of about 5 centimeters of water, meaning that the parietal space or the parietal actually pushes more fluid from the parietal area. If we start to look at the oncotic pressure, it is equal between the visceral and parietal layer. Therefore, the net driving force is greater on the parietal fluid. And you can actually see this below with the parietal fluid, pleural space and visceral pleura. And you can see these numbers with oncotic pressure. More importantly, pleural fluid turnover occurs at the parietal pleural level in the physiological conditions. Because a pressure gradient causes fluid to filter from the capillaries of the parietal pleura into the cavity and is drained through the lymphatics stomata that connect the pleural space to the submesothelial lymphatic network of the pleural pleura itself. Therefore, fluid filtration mostly occurs in less dependent regions and pleural fluid is drained towards preferential absorption sites at the bottom of the mediastinal region. So if we have a look where the both the upper lobe and middle lobe, you have high amounts of parietal fluid filtration. Whereas if you look at the intersection between the lower lobe and middle lobe, you have high amounts of absorption through the costal lymphatics. And then also you will have very high fluid reabsorption in the diaphragmatic lymphatics as well as the mediastinal lymphatics. So interestingly, it will work. The pleural fluid will move from the superior aspect of the thoracic cavity, will be reabsorbed inferiorly, medially and laterally, and more importantly at the diaphragmatic area. So if we look at the lymph fluid from the visceral pleura, it drains into the subpleural lymphatic plexus and into the bronchopulmonary nodes at the hilum of the lung. This is really important when understanding pneumothorax, hemothorax, as well as any forms of tumor or oncology for lesion production, as well as any form of ground glass opacities and so forth. So if you have a look here at the lymphatic drainage system, you have a cervical pleura, so the auxiliary lymph nodes. The blue line, which is completely lateral of either lung, is actually through the anterior parietal pleura. And then you will go through the internal mammary nodes. And then inferiorly, which you have the green line, you will actually have absorption into the internal mammary nodes, as well as the cardiophrenic and posterior diaphragmatic pleura. And medially, you always have the mediastinal pleura, which is, takes this fluid. So lymph fluid from the visceral pleura drains into the subpleural lymphatic plexus and into the bronchopulmonary nodes at the hilum of the lung. Interestingly, what we said before, that both the parietal and visceral pleura merge at the level of the hilum. And this is where there is no separation between the two. So now if we look at the pleural space and radiographic appearance. The pleural fluid accumulates in most dependent part of the thoracic cavity because the lung is less dense than pleural fluid. And in essence, the lung actually floats in pleural fluid. And we know this now from the increased amount of reabsorption and fluid dependency in the lower part of the lobes of the lung. And the lobes of the lung maintain their traditional shape at all stages of collapse, owing to their elastic recoil. So now if we take another look at a, di a diagrammatic explanation for the meniscus shaped pleural fluid that we see on x-rays. The distance between the lung and the chest wall is the same around the entire lung. The depth of the fluid when viewed in the PA is not sufficient to increase the density. More laterally, 
However, the X-ray beam passes through more of the pleural fluid so that an increase in density is radiologically evident. And this is more important when you come to do a lateral chest X-ray versus a PA. Now let's have a look at how this actually occurs. If my patient is completely upright, on the PA view in the lower costal margins in both costophrenic and cardiophrenic, on the PA, they look relatively normal because we have obscured density because of both the liver and also the stomach and spleen contents. However, on the lateral radiograph, you actually see that there is a pleural effusion. And inferiorly, we have actually cut off the costophrenic angle. So here you can actually determine that the side at which you have a pleural effusion, whether it's the right lung, it should be right side down. If the pleural fluid then redistributes to the dependent areas, then it is free flowing. However, if you look at the image to your right, and you had a loculated pleural effusion and you did not move, then definitely you know it's loculated. Now, this is really even more important in a portable chest X-ray environment. If you're doing this in emergency radiology or if you are actually performing this in uh, the intensive care unit, having an upright erect will actually show you the sharp meniscus appearance. And this is really good to show comparison of fluid changes or volume over time, especially when you're having multiple chest X-rays. Interestingly, if you perform a semi-erect chest X-ray, it will further accentuate the larger pleural space when in actual fact it is not the same. So this is really important when performing chest X-rays. If the patient started as an upright erect, then you need to continue it as an upright, upright erect chest X-ray. Now you can perform upright chest X-rays multiple ways. If a patient is quite large and has a large abdominal uh, circumference, you can tilt the bed forward by dropping the feet of the bed down where this allows you to have the chest completely perpendicular to the floor and completely upright. Now let's now take a look at pneumothorax. In chest radiology imaging with pneumothorax, we need to understand that we've already talked or know about the pleural space. We know the difference between the parietal and the visceral layer of the pleura. We also already know that there is a chamber which has fluid in it the whole time. Now when you have a pneumothorax, what happens then is you actually have a rupture of the lung parenchyma. So let's just take a look at how this occurs. So let's think about a wine glass with a balloon inside. If you have a ruptured balloon, air is still coming into the balloon. It's maintaining the size of the balloon, but air is escaping into that space. It starts to compress the lung and the pleural space begins to fill with air. And this is because you have a rupture of the visceral layer of the pleura. So when you're looking at the different types of pneumothorax, Okay, it is a complete rupture of the parenchyma, as you can see here with the red arrow. And the actual visceral pleura has been ruptured and not the parietal pleura. And so this is where we term this a closed pneumothorax. And if you have a look at this image, this is a typical example of a left upper lobe pneumothorax on a PA chest radiograph with full inspiration. You can see beyond the apices that there is no more vascular lung markings. Secondly, you can actually see they have a thickened area of the visceral pleura because it starts to build fluid in that area. Also, you can have a pneumothorax, but you will see vascular lung markings. But interestingly, above on the right-hand side of the image, you'll see subcutaneous emphysema. So here we have a rupture of both the parietal and visceral layer and with the air breathing in and the lung further expanding, air is actually being distributed past the thoracic cartilage and into the subcutaneous tissue.
If you have an open pneumothorax, this is a typical stab wound or a gunshot wound or any penetrating injury. And this is what occurs is that you have a rupture of both the parietal and visceral pleura and you have oxygen exchange or air exchange between the outside environment and the pleural space between the chest cavity and also within the actual pleural space. Also, you would have a ruptured visceral pleura. So as the patient breathes in and holds their breath, both the lung begins to collapse, air is traveling into the pleural space internally, and externally air is coming out as well externally. This next example is a typical gunshot wound of a patient. They have both uh, a lung expansion on both sides and you can still see the constant chest tube. As you can see in the bottom right hand side of the image, air is escaping from actually the axis of which the tube has gone into and you have large amounts of subcutaneous emphysema. For the same patient on CT, you will actually see that there is large amounts of subcutaneous emphysema, especially on the left side, you actually see there was bilateral pneumothorax with lung collapse and you can actually see the lung parenchyma is fibrosed and in the left lung posteriorly you'll see a fluid level there. The next type of pneumothorax is a tension pneumothorax. This is where both air is coming in and out and it starts to compress the entire parenchyma and so what occurs here is the lung actually collapses very quickly and it creates tension by starting to push the mediastinum to the other side. This is actually very dangerous. So here is a typical example, a patient who had a chest x-ray upon coming into the emergency department. As you can see there is a left lung total collapse. Two hours later this patient began to have tachycardia and you can actually see that it was completely shifted the mediastinum to the right side of the chest cavity, causing this to be a tension pneumothorax. This requires an urgent chest tube insertion. But more importantly, if you start to actually have a pneumothorax and you put in a chest tube and you want to take all that air out very fast, you end up actually getting pulmonary edema of the re-expanded lung. And this occurs because there is rapid expansion of the lung by removing the air out of the pleural space. So I want to take more notice in what occurs within the chest. Again, if you think about the balloon, the air is now being re-expanded. You'll get a double meniscus sign because the parietal pleura will actually have a C-shape or a cupping of fluid. And as the lung collapses, the medial side or the lateral side of the visceral pleura will actually have its second fluid level. That's why on a chest radiograph, you can actually see two fluid lines within the pleural space from a pneumothorax. This is not saying that it is loculated. This is only saying that the lung has completely collapsed internally. There is pleural fluid between the parietal and visceral layer of the pleural space. And the lung is taking time to re-expand. And this type of double pleural or double fluid line within the pleural space is called a hydropneumothorax. This means that the parietal pleura is beginning to produce excessive amounts of pleural fluid. If we look at this example here, this is a typical radiograph of a trauma patient where he has a single fluid line when a large chest patient and the patient was erect but more importantly you actually see the fluid tracking up into the pleural space so this is further exaggerating the amount of fluid in here ideally with this type of patient you would insert a pigtail catheter which has a high surface area to volume ratio to absorb that pleural fluid that's coming out of the lung